This time on One Foot Flipper, we talk about fake resellers. Stay tuned. One Foot Flipper. Hi, Paige here, the One Foot Flipper. Fake reseller, coming at you with all the latest topics. And before I get into our topic today, which is going to be the topic of fake resellers, I wanted to point out that Commonwealth Picker is running a few dibbed auctions right now to help disabled people in the space. One of them is a triple in a man auction to uh, help with my leg expenses. So yeah, I got a little bit of personal stake in that. And the other is a Taylor Swift CD to help fund Mary's wheelchair van via Isaiah House. Links to both are down in the description. These auctions only have a few days left as of this posting. So go ahead, pause the video, go bid, then come back. And if you can only afford to bid on one of them, then bid on Mary's CD. Those wheelchair vans are far more expensive than the process than prosthetic legs are. All right, so people are always talking about fake resellers, calling various YouTubers fake resellers. I thought I'd take a serious look at this idea, but I'm largely gonna avoid naming names in this video for the most part. First off, I don't. nobody should be called a fake reseller just because they get help one way or another. Like in my last video, John Ceramic, basically sourced and brought over for me a whole bunch of Apple II games and board games. Does that make me a fake reseller because I didn't find them on my own? No. It makes me a good reseller because I have contacts like John who found that stuff for me. And everybody's going to have their own advantages or disadvantages that way. And I don't believe any of that makes them a fake reseller unless they literally aren't involved in a single part of the process. Now, if it was the case that John found the item, then he brought it over, then my wife listed it, and my daughter sold it, and I was not involved in it in one bit, yeah, maybe then you could probably call me a fake reseller, but I don't think that sort of thing describes many or anyone really in this space. First, I'm going to look at the more rare situation, the true fake reseller. This person is a theoretical social media personality that makes reselling videos but does not themselves resell. Now yes, these people do actually exist. There's a few of them that I interact with frequently, I'm not going to call them out. However, they are most common as short form creators. They'll make short for shorts about fake valuable finds, they might repurpose video taken from other places. Or they might simply walk around the thrift store, talk about what to not buy, and they'll never actually buy anything. And I think those are probably the only true, completely fake resellers in the space. I've never actually found anybody who, with a channel where they actually pretend to, to have a bunch of sales and purchases that they never actually have. I've never actually seen that. If you have seen that, I'd actually go ahead and put that in the comments if you've actually seen that. But I've never, never seen that. Uh, now, this true fake reseller I was just talking about, they might actually make long-form content, but the, but fake fake resellers like that, they're going to completely concentrate on instructional content and live question and answer type of content. It's because they don't have any sales to show. They don't have any pickups to show. They, they, there might be value in their instruct, instructional content, though. It could be anywhere from complete garbage to 100% gold. One can... One can become an expert on and teach a subject without ever having practiced that subject themselves. I mean, history teachers, for example. <laughs> they have not made any history themselves, but they can still teach it just fine. I don't know anybody offhand that falls into this category, but it would be difficult to spot if they're doing their research properly. Like, I can research a video... I can spend three or four hours researching something and do a video about a reselling topic that I previously knew nothing about and because of the research time I put in, I can have real good information. And somebody else could do that too without ever reselling. And finally in the class of the true fakes are those who have stopped or basically stopped reselling but they never stop making reselling videos. And what you're going to see with those people are you're going to see a lot of instructional content, guest appearances, podcasts, and lives. And I'm sure there are plenty of these people out there at any given time. And honestly, I have no bad feelings, feelings for them. Most of them are eventually going to give up the social media or actually start reselling again. Maybe they just didn't have time to do both and they cared more about the YouTube than they did about the reselling. But either 
they fall off or they come back almost always. Uh, there could be some edge cases of the true fake reseller that are hard to categorize. Like a lot of people will bring up daily refinement. I would not personally call daily refinement a fake reseller. But for several years now, his reselling has all been on whatnot, while his videos largely continue to be about eBay and more traditional reselling websites. So the videos are about something he's not doing anymore. And I'll talk a little bit later about the transition to whatnot and what that means and does in reselling. Now, let's talk about the mainstream fake resellers. You know, the fake resellers, which as far as I can tell is every single reseller with a YouTube channel can be called a fake reseller by somebody. Here's the thing. Being a reseller itself is one career. Being a social media person is a different career. And being a social media reseller is a different, much more difficult career than either one of the original two. What makes it different is that in order to be a successful social media reseller, you have to have the skills of both being a successful reseller and being a successful social media personality, and you're limiting yourself to a rather small space on YouTube. I mean, the YouTube social media space, social media reselling space caps out at five or 600,000 subscribers, wherever Harry Tornado or whoever it is who has the most, that's about where it tops, that is about where it tops out. It's not like other topics where you could get a million subscribers in three weeks if you made the right content, or you could get 10, 20, 30 million subscribers in larger areas. It's a more niche, difficult one. So the combination with is very difficult. And the really honest truth is that Social media time is a complete financial sink for the overwhelming majority of social media resellers. For almost all of them, it would be absolutely far more profitable just to plow all that time into reselling. I know that my sales fell off a cliff when I started my channel and they never recovered. You know why? Because I was suddenly, half the time that I was spending on reselling was now being put into social media and video production at a much lower payout. Uh, we can even look at my numbers as an example. As I write this right now, I'm just under 7,000 subscribers. I get about 70,000 view views a month on YouTube. That I do make shorts though, so that is in between shorts and full length videos. And that's going to put me somewhere between the top 10% and top 1% of YouTube reselling channels. I really have no way to calculate that number more accurately than that, as the number of regularly posting channels with a handful to a few hundred subscribers is so vastly large that I feel like it would be impossible to count. I keep finding channels with 10,000 subscribers that I've never heard of. So counting everybody with 100 subs seems impossible to me. So I'm somewhere in the top 10% to top 1%, somewhere in there. And I make about $300 a month directly from YouTube. And I figure viewer sales likely boost my monthly profits about another $100. That is $400 a month, and I spend at least 80 hours a month to make that $400. That is a cool $5 an hour before taxes, also before self-employment taxes, because I've got no employer kicking in that part like it would be if I had a job. Doesn't count any YouTube expenses like this uh, big fancy expensive camera that's uh, recording me right now. Uh, the expensive microphone that I'm not using right now and other gear like that doesn't count for any of that. Now, these days, it, people keep saying that $20 an hour is some sort of minimum income. So I would be able to need to be at four times that to even make it worthwhile. And even then, it didn't really get me to $20 an hour. Once you count self-employment or something, it really gets me down to 17 or something. And assuming I could scale my... Assuming that more views meant scaled up exactly to more income, I would need 28,000 subscribers, 280,000 views a month to make my YouTube time worth what it would cost to instead work in the McDonald's drive through And now I know if I had 28,000 subs that I would certainly be in the top 1% of the YouTube reseller space. Could even be the top 10% of the top of the 1%. I don't know. I can't calculate the size of the space. If anybody has any way to do it, reach out to me, let me know. But I just have no idea how many channels are out there. 
Uh, so I can say for certain, using my model of frequent videos and not particularly seeking out viewer sale type items would be an overall loss for at least 99% of the people who tried it. But Paige, the railroad reseller, and Jimmy the Dolphin Flipper, they specifically set themselves up to maximize viewer sales. They have their family involved in the channel. Have you seen how cute Jimmy's son is? Have you seen the railroad reseller's twin girls? Have you seen their wives? They're gorgeous. And their stores are filled with nothing but viewer sale items, such as vintage toys, plush, and other minor cool luxury items that any viewer might be interested in. True, there is that, but I've examined quite a few channels of varying sizes, specifically looking at their eBay sales and looking for viewer sales. There is a way to spot viewer sales if you want to look at somebody's channel that tends to be fairly easy. As you find items that have specific names, items that are very easy to search for. And if you find that Jimmy the Dolphin Flipper sold his Nintendo Metroid cartridge for $37, but the going rate for a Nintendo Metroid cartridge is $25, you know that is a viewer sale because there's no other way that cartridge would have sold that far above market. Not when there's a hun hundreds of them available on eBay. Something like, and that is the way that I spot, that I have always used to spot viewer sales. It is that well, easy to find sale that sells for well above market. And I don't think anybody, anybody's eBay is living off viewer sales. Nope. Not even Kevin. The thing about viewer sales is that they tend to be low dollar and very time intensive. Viewers buy cheap items. Then you have to work that viewer in your next video. Overall, that makes viewer sales very high labor. For example, I currently clear between $2.94 and $3.54 on my death pile monster mascots. Depends on if you happen to be that one person who gets the 10% off whenever I send that out every once in a while. And that isn't exactly lighting up my bank account. And this cheap item thing has been backed up by ADH Dave, who said very clearly that his eBay viewer sales basically went to zero when he stopped listing things under $15. Because most viewers aren't buying high dollar items. For the most part, they're buying low dollar items. They want to, they want to see themselves mentioned in the video, or they want to support the channel, but they don't necessarily want to buy a $50 or $60 item, particularly if it's something specialty or niche. Meanwhile, getting your family involved in the channel is more labor from more people. Sure. Definitely going to increase the viewer sale effect because it's going to make people care about you and people who care about you are going to be more involved. But it has a real labor cost to it. I've seen people do multi-hour whatnot shows with three, four, five people involved. Maybe a sixth one who has paid $20 an hour to set it up in advance, which is, Dave, which is more than I have ever made in paid employment, by the way. I, if you ever want to pay me to set up your whatnot, definitely would do it. And that sort of thing massively increases the labor cost. And I don't know if it actually produces a positive return at anything other than the highest one-tenth of one percent levels of the space. The closest thing I've actually come to finding living off of eBay viewer sale channels are a couple of smaller channels, nowhere near close to top tier. My, my channel size are smaller. But they do all of the things to get viewers caring about them. Family involvement. They they talk about their viewers constantly. They're always positive about everyone. They get people really involved. And they're specifically sourcing nothing but viewer sale items. And overall, the few that I found like that, they don't tend to operate with a business plan. They price guess all their items. And thus, their sales tend to be when they guess the price right or viewer sales and like i said i only found two channels like that and neither one of them sold all that much on an absolute basis or a dollar basis so that was definitely not a path to sure thing success on reselling now let's talk about the transition to whatnot why i think it's dangerous one area where a social media seller's popularity can be harnessed and converted directly into dollars is in live auctions. Whatnot, 
Dib did. You can even run a live auction directly on YouTube. Angie Resells does that off and on, and she used to do it quite often. Very successful at it. However, this is a very expert area, and to be truly profiting off this, you've got to have the skill, personality, drive, and experience to absolutely be at the top of your social media reselling game. Even then, you've got to be extremely careful with it. Uh, I've seen popular resellers sell 50 cents worth of Magic Gathering cards for $50 on whatnot. I've seen countless $2 plush items and toys sell for $10. I've seen many, many items sell for far above eBay value. However, on the other side of the coin, I've seen top resellers eventually, essentially give away valuable items because they didn't realize how niche those items are. If you don't get two people in your auction who either recognize or are interested in the item or recognize in its resale, recognize its resale potential value, then that item could be given away for one or two dollars. And I've seen many, many auctions where the extra people involved in the auction drive the labor costs so high that it would have made way more sense just to eBay all the items. When you've got your husband, both kids, a cat, Grandpa Terry, and guest star railroad reseller in from Arkansas on your three hour whatnot, then you suddenly just went to burning three man hours with that, to do that show, to burning 18 man hours and three cat hours. I'm not sure how much a cat hour is worth, but it can't be free. Somebody's one of you people who have pets that are somehow expenses, you could let me know about that. And you not only need to be careful about what you sell live, you have to be careful that you don't wear out your audience. The first time you buy something from Jimmy the Dolphin Flipper live, it's probably thrilling to win that item, hear him say your name, and maybe he'll go, double chrono! However, the tenth time isn't so thrilling. So as auctions become more and more frequent, find yourself skipping more and more of them till suddenly you're not going to Jimmy's auctions at all anymore. And you can also wear out your audience in a different way. Most viewers of resale content are either resellers themselves, they fantasize about reselling, or they live their reselling life vicariously through your, your channel and others. However, very few of those viewers are fantasizing about being whatnot sellers. The more your channel becomes about whatnot, the less appealing your channel is. The less viewers start, the more viewers will start tuning out instead of tuning in. I've looked at a few very large channels that have basically transitioned entirely to whatnot as far as their sales are concerned, and they have all had long-term drops in monthly views between 65% and 80% after the whatnot transition. You know what this can end up with? This can end up with people who once loved their reseller social media career and they used to love it and make great money on it and they transitioned to doing very grindy work that they really don't like that long term ends up paying off worse than what they were doing before. Now I'm sure this video is going to get a lot of comments that are negative about different people and unfortunately I won't be really interacting with those comments. A much better YouTuber than I has reminded me several times not to heart bad comments and now I keep a note at my workstation just to remind me of that. Now, I myself have never personally done any live auctions. I might indeed do some one day. Uh, eventually, my card store will stop turning a monthly profit, or it'll get close to where it's no longer turning one. And I plan on liquidating that box by box. I think live would be the best way to do that. But if I do live auctions, I'm going to limit the frequency of them so I don't wear out my audience. I've been blessed enough with even getting a second half of my life because I almost died when I lost a leg, much less the second half of life success. I mean, I mean, I really only drug myself up from lower class to middle class, but hey, it's that's still success in my book, and I don't want to ruin any of it. Hey, if you know anyone who bids on anything, then tell them about this channel. I'm currently knocking on the door of 7,000 subscribers. I wouldn't mind if that door opened so I could come in. Hope to see you again soon.